This is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, I have a story on a former Somali refugee who won a UN award. Dan Friedel reports on an airplane that crossed the Atlantic Ocean using fuel made from animal fat. Brian Lynn has this week's technology report on Google's plan to start removing inactive user accounts. Later, Andrew Smith and Joe Robbins present the lesson of the day. But first... The United Nations Refugee Agency has named a former child refugee from Somalia winner of this year's Nansen Refugee Award. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees or UNHCR, recognized Abdullah Mire for providing 100,000 books to Somali refugees in camps in Kenya. Mire is now 36 years old. Last year, 2022, Angela Merkel, the former federal chancellor of Germany, won the award and today a young refugee from Dadaab. The sky is not the limit. Mire told VOA Somalia. Filippo Grandi is president of the UNHCR. He said Mire is living proof that transformative ideas can come out of displaced communities. He has shown great resourcefulness and tenacity in strengthening the quality of refugee education, Grandi said in a statement. Mire was born in southern Somalia in 1987. In 1991, his family fled the country because of Somalia's civil war. I fled from Kuryole in the lower Shabel region in 1991 with my mother and grew up and lived in the Dadaab refugee camps for 23 years, Mire told VOA. The Dadaab complex in northeastern Kenya today has a population of more than 240,000 refugees, most from Somalia. Over half of the camp's population are children. Mire finished elementary and secondary schooling while living in the camp. He went on to earn a college degree in public relations and journalism from Kenya's Kenyatta University. He said his mother gave him help and support to become, in his words, a voice for my vulnerable population. Mire got a job with the United Nations International Organization for Migration in Somalia. He worked in the capital Mogadishu and the southern cities of Baidoa and Kismayo. He said his childhood in Dadaab and professional experience taught him the importance of his education. So he decided to dedicate his professional life to helping his fellow refugees. In early 2018, he started an organization called Refugee Youth Education Hub. The organization centers on refugee education and youth development. After shortly living in Norway, he returned to Dadaab to help. I had a yearning to serve my community that drew me back to the camp, he said. A refugee woman who was studying medicine in Dadaab inspired him to collect books for refugee camps, Mire said. She told me about 20 girls normally shared one biology book. That inspired me to use social media for a book collection 
and donation campaign till we reached 100,000 books. Mire is not the only Somali who has won the Nansen Refugee Award. In 2012, the UNHCR presented Hawa Aden Mohammed with the award for her work to help Somali refugee and displaced females. The award is named for the Norwegian explorer, scientist, diplomat, and humanitarian Fridtjof Nansen. British businessman Richard Branson and Britain's Department of Transport organized a flight crossing the Atlantic Ocean by a jet using fuel made from animal fat. The Boeing 787 passenger airplane flew from London to New York on Tuesday using what the organizers called sustainable jet fuel. Branson founded Virgin Atlantic Airlines. The airline said it used a fuel made from waste fats, including animal fat used in cooking. The transport department spent over $1.2 million for the flight. Branson was on the plane, along with reporters, engineers, and government officials as it crossed the Atlantic Ocean there were no paying passengers. The world will always assume something can't be done until you do it, Branson said. The transport department called the trip a huge step towards Jet Zero. Jet Zero is a play on words. It means the trip did not use traditional jet fuel that comes from oil. Some officials in the international air travel industry say they hope their companies can reach what is called net zero by 2050. Net zero is a proposed balance between the release of carbon gases into the atmosphere and the capture of those gases. However, organizers admit the mix of fuel used on Tuesday's trip will not be widely available anytime soon. The U.S. Department of Energy says sustainable aviation fuel is the best way to reach the net zero target by 2050. The government says sustainable aviation fuel cuts the release of greenhouse gases gases said to cause warming by 70%. However, the Department of Energy said the 2050 goal is aspirational. That means it is unlikely to be reached. In the U.S., sustainable jet fuel production increased from about 8 million liters in 2016 to about 60 million liters in 2022, but that is only about 0.1% of the fuel used by major airlines. In 2018, the Federal Aviation Administration set a goal of producing about 15 billion liters per year. President Joe Biden's administration said in 2021 that it wanted three times that amount by 2030 and for commercial airlines to fly on 100% sustainable fuel by 2050. In Britain, the goal is for 10% of jet fuel to come from what it calls sustainable sources by 2030. Holly Boyd Boland is an official with Virgin Atlantic. She said... Tuesday's flight shows a sustainable flight is possible, but the difficulty is in producing enough of the new fuel 
so that we're flying more sustainable aviation fuel every day. Kate Hewitt is the policy director for the British nonprofit group Aviation Environment Federation. The group is interested in reducing the effect of the aviation industry on the environment. She said, the idea that this flight somehow gets us closer to guilt-free flying is a joke. She said it will be difficult to increase production of sustainable jet fuel to the point that it makes a difference. I'm Dan Friedel. Google is about to start deleting accounts considered inactive. The company plans to start removing inactive accounts that users have not used or signed into for more than two years on December 1st. Google announced the policy in May saying it could begin removing affected accounts in December 2023. User data that could be deleted includes content stored within Google Drive, Docs, Gmail, and other services. Google says users with accounts at risk of being deleted should have already received email messages explaining the policy and the steps required to keep accounts active. The company said the deletion process will start with Google accounts that were created but never used again. Google is urging users who want to save their accounts and related data to take some form of action by the end of this week. Google has said its policy to delete old, unused accounts is designed to remove security risks related to those accounts. In its announcement, Google said accounts that go long periods of time without activity are more likely to be compromised. The reasons for this include the fact that forgotten or unused accounts often depend on old or reused passwords. Another thing that puts such accounts at risk is the lack of two-step security processes that became popular in recent years to help users keep their accounts secure. This security tool, called two-factor authentication, aims to reduce the risk of Internet attackers taking over personal accounts and stealing data. In addition, old and unused accounts receive fewer security checks by the user, Google said. Google says the best way to keep a user account active is to sign into it at least once every two years. But there are some other actions that meet the requirements for keeping a Google account active. These include sending or looking at emails, using Google Search, and watching videos on Google-owned YouTube. The user must be signed in to their Google account when performing these actions. The policy covers Google Photos as well. The company explains that the simplest way to avoid losing saved pictures and videos is to visit Google Photos on the web or through the app. When signed in, users just need to perform some activity. For example, they can look through an image collection, share a photo or video, 
or backup content in photos. Google says it only plans to delete old or unused accounts for personal users. Accounts that were set up for organizations, such as schools or businesses, will not be affected. Other exceptions include Google accounts controlled by an adult for a child. Or accounts that have been used to buy goods or services on an ongoing basis. Google has also noted there are no current plans to delete accounts with YouTube videos. Google does offer users some tools to help them save and back up stored data. One of them is called Takeout. This service permits users to download and export account data outside of Google at any time. An account holder can use this method to back up stored data or to use it with a service outside of Google. In addition, Google offers a tool called Inactive Account Manager. Which permits users to choose what would happen to their accounts and data if it does become inactive. The choices for activating this service include having files sent to a set of trusted contacts, or requesting that the whole account be deleted. Google also asks that all its users. Provide a recovery email for their account. This can be an important method for getting a user back into a locked account, and can also be helpful for sending inactive account messages and other communications. I'm Brian Lin. Brian Lin joins me now to talk more about his technology report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course, Dan. Thank you for having me. In this week's report, you explored a policy by Google to delete user accounts that are no longer considered active. The company has explained it thinks this policy is necessary to reduce security risks. Right. Yes, that's right.、Um, one of the fears Google has is that these inactive accounts,、uh, ones that have not been used in at least two years, could be taken over by internet hackers. And if these accounts are taken over or compromised,、uh, they could be used to steal data from users or used in crimes of extortion, in which people or groups. Demand money from individuals in exchange for not releasing private data or personal details about them. Has Google provided any numbers on how many inactive accounts we're talking about? No, not specifically. But experts have noted that Google has a total of nearly five billion users worldwide, and is by far the most popular search engine, with a market share of over ninety percent. So that is already a lot of users, and many of them also have Google accounts. And of course, many people could have even set up multiple accounts over the years,、um, but just never took any action to officially close those accounts. Got it. Thanks for joining me, Brian. You're welcome, Dan. Thank you. My name is Jill Robbins, and I'm Andrew Smith. You're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series. Let's learn English. This series shows Anna Mateo in her work and life in Washington D.C. 
In lesson 41 of the Let's Learn English series, Anna is going to receive a review of her work from her boss, Ms. Weaver. A work review often lets an employee know what they are doing well and what they could improve. That means Ms. Weaver will give Anna some feedback. Andrew, I think feedback is an important word to know, especially as it relates to work or job performance. I agree. And you can get feedback about almost any kind of thing you are working on. For example, if you write a paper for school, or if you write a song or draw a picture, another person can tell you what they think about your paper song, or picture. When we give someone feedback, we usually point out what we think they have done well and some things we think they could change to make it better. At the end of today's lesson, we're going to ask you to write us and tell us about advice or feedback you have received. And we'll also invite you to give advice about ways people can improve their English. But first, Let's see what Ms. Weaver tells Anna. Anna, hello. Hello. Sit down. As you know, at the start of a new year, we have a work review. Yes. It's time for mine. Yes. Anna, this chart shows the audience of the Time Traveling Treehouse. If you look at it, you will see something bad. Your audience is going down, down, down. Ms. Weaver, I think the chart is upside down. Here, let's flip that around. <laughs> now it's right side up. If you look at this chart, you will see something good. Your audience is big. Good. But not big enough. Not good. I want to see these numbers. Go up and up and up. It sounds like Ms. Weaver is very ambitious. That's spelled A-M-B-I-T-I-O-U-S. Ambitious means she has a strong desire to do more and see more improvement. Yes, even after Anna flipped the chart around... Ms. Weaver said the audience numbers needed to increase more. And let's talk about this word, flip. We can flip things around in a physical sense, but we also talk about flipping ideas around. When you flip an idea around, that means you try to think about things in a different way or an opposite way. Right. For example... Many people might think that living in a big house would be better than living in a small house. But we can flip this idea around and say that living in a small house would be better because a small house costs less and there is less work to do to keep it clean and perhaps for some other reasons. We flip something over like a piece of paper. Or like flipping an egg over to cook it on both sides. And when we flip something around, that means we rotate or turn it the way Anna turned her chart. And if something is upside down, we turn it to make it right side up. And here's where we have another expression. We can talk about the world being turned upside down. If your world has been turned upside down, that means there have been some very big changes in your life. And when we talk about the kind of changes that turn your world upside down, we usually refer to changes that are unexpected, unwanted, or difficult to deal with. Now, let's return to Anna's work review. Ms. Weaver told Anna, If you look at it, you will see something bad. Ms. Weaver is saying something she is sure about. 
So, she uses the modal will before the verb see. But notice that the clause, you will see something bad, depends on something else happening first. It depends on a certain condition. And that condition is expressed by the if clause. If you look at it. In this example, the verb in the if clause is in the simple present tense. We call the combination of an if clause in the simple present, followed by another clause with the modal will, the future real conditional. A future real conditional just means if something happens, then something else will really happen in the future. Like in this example. If we stay up all night, we will be tired the next day. I'm Jill Robbins, and you're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. You can find more examples and ways to practice the future real conditional by going to our website at learningenglish.voanews.com and downloading the lesson plan that comes with Lesson 41 of Let's Learn English. We can use the real future conditional to give advice. For example, Jill can give people learning English advice like this. If you learn more vocabulary, you will understand more English. And if you use a new word several times, you will be more likely to remember it. Okay, listeners, now it's your turn. What advice can you give to help people learn English? Send us your answers using the future real conditional at learningenglish at voanews.com. And as Dr. Jill said earlier in today's lesson of the day, we'd also like you to tell us about a time that you received feedback. And be sure to tell us how the feedback was or was not helpful to you. Write to us at learningenglish at voanews.com. Okay, before we go, we should check back on Anna's work review. Listen carefully. What does Anna notice about the posters that Ms. Weaver shows Anna? I want to see these numbers go up and up and up. How, Ms. Weaver? I have something. Idea posters. Idea posters. You really ought to think seriously about them. I like this one. Read it, please. If at first you succeed, you will be a success. Well, it's a cute cat. Here's another one. I like it. Working hard looks hard because it really is hard. I see. It's another cute cat. This is my favorite. Oh, teamwork works best with a team. A team of cats? Look at all those cats! So, Anna, do you understand what I want? Yes, Ms. Weaver. I understand. Do you think Anna really understands what Ms. Weaver wants? What animal did Anna notice? And what do you think Anna will do next? You can bet it's going to be silly. <laughs> to find out, go to learningenglish at voanews.com and watch Lesson 41 of Let's Learn English. And remember that you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Thanks for listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 